when I talked to Steve about doing this, uh, I thought maybe I was just going to talk about uh, how you uh, the division of the of the uh, pyroxenes and garnets and things like that. But when I started getting into it, I decided that really, if I'm going to talk about nomenclature and names, we need to go back to the beginning. And in order to do that, we have to look at the, the a new mineral comes up. What what are the important things, or what what does it take to get there? One is it takes something somebody to find something, and not recognize it. So recognition is a thing. And then there's a whole bunch of tools that you use to get the properties of this so that you can tell that it is a new species. And the subtitle here is pre precision plus time equals accuracy. I think you'll understand what I'm doing when I get to the end of this. But so I started back at the beginning building the toolbox. So what is a mineral? This is a new definition from the IMA is a naturally occurring crystalline substance with a well-defined chemical composition. And they throw elements in there and they throw in a few things that are generally not crystalline like opal and mercury. So why are we talking about this? What's the most abundant mineral in the Earth's crust? Ice, quartz, or feldspar? We'll answer that question just at the very end, but you can think about it. Okay, mineral, minerals have been known forever and ever because the hand tools that were used back in the in the Neolithic and then proceeding on further, where they knew that flint was a hard breakable thing that made a, a uh, sharp cutting edge. The, the Far East had jade, there's copper, gold, silver, and salt, and turquoise. So we start with names that go back way beyond written records. And then in the Bronze Age, we got the alloy of copper and tin to make, bron make bronze. Um, mercury and nickel alloys from meteorites were known to be hard. So um, then in, this surprised me. In the Bible, there's a list of 23 decorative stones. Most of them are not species. And um, there's also a list of the precious stones that were used in the foundation of Solomon's temple. The same period of time, the Egyptians were using natron as a de desiccant uh, for the mummification process. And also the Egyptian women and were using galena, malachite, stibnite, and azurite as eyeshadow. Aristotle des described minerals and their properties, including mostly metaphysical. All substances were comprised of water, air, earth, fire. And he divided those into two groups, those affected by heat and those affected by dampness. Pliny the Elder in 17 a 77 AD wrote Naturalist Historia, which classified the earth, metals, stones, and gems, a total of about 200, 350. And he was the first contribution to crystallography by, by describing the crystal habits of these minerals. And then there was the Islamic alchemist theory that sulfur and mercury went together to make and transport all, all, everything. So in the Far East, there was 400 BC, there was a 24 mineral list in, by Zing Nizi, Zing, whatever, I don't do Chinese well. Metaphysical, based on basically on metaphysical properties, very similar to Aristotle. And then in the 500 AD, there was this quote by Qing Pan Wang, the most precious thing in the world are stored in the innermost regions for all. For example, there is Rialgar. After a thousand years, it changes to Orpiment. 
After another thousand years, it changes to yellow gold. While this is really um, alchemy at best, it there is some truth in this because we do know that Realgar changes to Orpheme and those kinds of systems, mineral, mineralizing systems have are associated with gold, like the Getcho mine. Oh. It's really a gold. The, the profit there is a gold, is the gold, not the arsenic. And then there was um, a systematic lim, uh, system by Su Xiong, uh, listing the minerals in their medical, medical properties, medicinal properties. So the earliest tool was, a, was the earliest tool was really color, your eyes, and heft. Why well, specific gravity by heft? This rock's heavier than that. If you if you had a, a piece of barite and a piece of quartz, the, you could by hand you can tell that the barite is denser than the quartz. So the magnifying lens was first described in 424 BC by Aristophanes. And it's in a, a work that he did made called The Clouds. Pliny the Elder described a glass globe filled with water in his Natural History, published in 77 AD. The interesting thing that goes along with this is that Pliny said that he could get enough heat out of that to cauterize wounds. I think it must have been a hell of a glass globe. Okay, so then we go to 1530 when Agricola, Georgius Agricola also, which is a pen name for George Bauer. He started out by writing a physical geology book, then a mineralogy and metallurgy book, and the final was De Re Metallica, which I think most people are aware of. It's a mining textbook, which, um, covered all aspects of mining and was used for a textbook for 200 years. He is posthumously is known as the father of mineralogy because of his descriptions of the minerals and their occurrence in this mining book. Then we come along in 1669 to Nicholas Steno. And he's recognized that the, that the um, angles between regular faces of crystals are always the same despite the shape or size of the crystals. And he basically invented the first contact goniometer. The blowpipe, I don't know how many of you are old enough like me to have used blowpipe analyses, but uh, it works. The origin, the origin of the blowpipe is lost to real antiquity. We do know that the, in 2500 BC, the Egyptians were using blowpipes in jewelry for soldering. Bartholin in his treatise on Iceland spar said that he could burn the Iceland spar to, to um, lime with a blowpipe. And in 1831, Faraday said that it was the most useful laboratory instrument around. So the blowpipe was used if you have both an oxidizing and a reducing parts of the flame. And by how you direct the flame onto the mineral specimen, usually tested on a charcoal block, or an, and then there's other tests with the blowpipe with open tubes and closed tubes that give, give you different elements. The next greatest big step was Joseph Black in 1750. As a grad student at the University of Edinburgh, he developed a two pan analytical balance. Now we know from Egyptian uh, writings and motifs that they used a, a two beam balance. So why wasn't this good enough? Because it wasn't accurate to very small amounts because they hadn't developed the 
the idea of a lightweight, very sensitive fulcrum and beam, which Black have developed. And that we've all seen these old analytical balances or assay balances. Um, and they, they, were, they were the balance standard for 200 years. Warner in 1749, 1774, sorry, proposed the chemical classification of minerals based on the periodic chart that was just being developed. And he was the first to name a species after a person, which was not met well with the community at the time. Brazilius refined Warner's classification based on chemical classifications used today on the periodic table. He also made a, uh, a uh, publication on blowpipe analysis and chemical mineralogy. And he said that he has found new elements by using a blowpipe analysis because he got things that just didn't match the, the known. So in 1819, William Phillips wrote an introduction to mineralogy and it's really a first descriptive mineralogy. And on the left side, you can see that I've copied a small portion of the index. Some minerals are named like we are, like we still use them today, like cryolite and cuprite. But others like Carivi, arsenica, octahedra, blus, which I pulled up on the right, is happens to be Larachanum. And so we have a, a system where names were being described as chemicals and by their physical and properties. And this went on for a, for, for a period of time. You can find a lot of these. I've had old German labels with names like this on them and it had to go look them up and figure out what they really were. In um, 1801, Howe defined crystallography and in 1822, he showed the first structure of how a salt cube grows. And just for you, Martin, he's got crystal models. This was the origin origin of the crystal model. So you could match you could match the models to your specimens. I had a friend that he, he died a few months back, but he he made a complete set of them, and even even sent the set over to the Smithsonian. Um, that's good. I've never been able to find a set. Uh, then 1822, we got the hardness scale from, from Frederick Moat. In 1828, we get nickel developing the polarizing prism, or the, yeah, the, the prism that actually sorts light into one Ray, and that led to the polarizing microscope, which gave optical properties of these minerals. And you could see smaller pieces and get characteristics and figure out that there was one or two or three different species here or, or phases. 1837, we end up with Dana doing his system, the first system. Went one volume. By 1997, it was 1,842 pages of tissue paper um, with huge numbers of errors in it. And like I told Antidote the other day, last, last meeting, 
The reason that that has so many errors in it is that the publisher got it in electronic form from the authors and decided they didn't like the program it was, was in. So they had a bunch of secretaries retype the thing. And they had, with no mineral background, no knowledge. So that's why there's so many errors in it, because it was, it was proofed very well beforehand. 1839, Babinet invented the optical goniometer, the one circle optical goniometer. And in this one, you mounted your specimen on that central prism and you used light coming in from one side and reflecting into the, off of the this crystal face to, through the little telescope on the right side. The real problem with this was if you had pyramidal faces, you, how do you, you had to remount the specimen somehow and keep the orientation in order to get all the, the symmetry faces. Miller in 1839 described in his treatise on crystallography, he described six different crystal systems with comments on the symmetry of each. And he also describes this, uh, a series of Miller indices, which describe the faces and can, be, and can be used to determine the symmetry. This is a simple uh, diagram showing Miller indices values uh, for a cube. So in the first one, A1 is the A, in cube A equals B, A, A equals B equals C, and all are at 90 degrees. So a one unit crossing the A axis only is a zero, zero, is a one, zero, zero, A, B, C, and the number of units, because these are planes within the symmetry. And it's three energies, inter, three in, it's always described by three energies because that is three dimensional space. In uh, 1848, we get the manual of mineralogy from Dana. This is more like a mineralogy textbook. In 1859, Kirchhoff and Bunsen determine that the electromagnetic spectrum that you see from a, a prism or the visual spectrum applied to a whole lot more than just the visual spectrum. They understood that, that this um, spectroscopy was a st the study of all of the electromagnetic spectrum, which led to spectroscopy instruments being developed. Now we go to x-rays. In 1895, Rontgen uh, discovered x-rays and he called them x-rays because um, he didn't know what, the, what else to call them. They weren't any, anything that was known. And that stuck. And there's a typo. The x should be capitalized and the r should be small. That's the way he wrote it. In 1896, we have Goldschmidt, Victor Goldschmidt, who's a geochemist, invented the two circle goniometer. This one, you can do the horizontal prism faces, and with the second circle, you can do the pyramidal faces. The mineralogy, courtesy of Wendell Wilson, there's a, a picture of the two circles two circle contact goniometer that um, is the uh, symbol for min record. And the second one is an optical goniometer two circle. And then in 1918, Goldschmidt published the Atlas de la Crystal Foreman, which has an immense number of drawings of all kinds of 
of crystals. So just that that picture on the right is a um, set of Atlas de Crystal of Foreman, republished by the Rochester Mineral Society in the 80s, 70s or 80s. That's when I got mine. Then by 1898, Dana's son, Edward Salisbury, completed the textbook of mineralogy. And to my mind, the red fourth edition is what I carried in my vehicle. It lived, it had a place to live in my exploration field vehicle the entire time I worked as an exploration geologist, because I think it's one of the best sources of information on new things or identifying things in the field. Then in 1912, we have the Braggs. And they figured out the, um, the law of X-ray diffraction in, in um, crystals. And so they figured this is, this is said, this has led to all kinds of X-ray equipment being developed. Lowy, he had an, he got a Nobel Prize for the diffraction of X-rays by crystals. And then aside from this very interesting little aside that I came across, he was an anti-Nazi. He left Germany for Denmark, but when the Nazis started moving towards Denmark, he uh, he had been working in the one of the big labs and had already had his Nobel Prize, but he couldn't take it across out of Germany or out of German territory. So he and a chemist dissolved the Nobel Prizes in, in Aqua Regia and set them on the back shelf of the, of the reagent shelf of the lab. When they came back after the war, they were still there. So they re-precipitated the gold and took it back to the Nobel Committee who recast his Nobel Prize with the original gold. <laughs> Herbert Hoover, his contribution in the, in the uh, besides being the president of the United States, which didn't really help mineralogy any, um, was a trans, he and his wife, who was a linguist, translated De Re Metallica into English. Um, and that's basically. He graduated from Stanford and he worked as an exploration geologist around the world. He co-founded the zinc mining company at Broken Hill, Australia. I didn't know that till I just started doing this. I thought that was a very interesting fact. 1916, Dubai and Shur developed a, the powder, powder method of diffraction for identifying substances. And the Dubai Share camera is shown on the right, used a piece of 35 millimeter film punched with two holes, one for the columnator and one for the catcher. And this, the specimen went on a little spindle that rotated in the middle. The lower left is a diffractometer from the 60s. For 1916, was the first issue of the mineralogy, American Mineralogist. And Bob Downs told me something yesterday that the, the American Mineralogist split off from some amateur magazine. He wasn't sure whether it was rocks and minerals or one of the others. I still haven't been able to research that. In 18, 1922, Ralph Wyckoff wrote the theory of space groups, which explained the permissible locations of elements in the lattice. These are known as the Wyckoff positions. 
The electron microscope was invented in 1937 by a German from an aristocratic family. He, and he was a smart guy. I'll dream. At age 15, he, he had already received his first patent. He, he transmitted the first TV pictures in 1933, I think it was at the Olympics, of Olympics, and developed a working transmission electron microscope. He then went, was taken to the Soviet Union, worked on the bomb. He, he, was, he um, returned to Germany and with 600 patents when he died in 1997. The picture on the right lower is the, the first scanning electron microscope. The, the scanning electron microscope was then commercialized at, by Cambridge Scientific Instrument Company. They called it the stereo scan. And the picture on the lower left is one from the Zeiss, Live, Zeiss Museum of, the, of this uh, MK1 stereo scanning electron microscope. It's qualitative. One of its biggest features is you can is the backscatter imaging which depends upon the number of electrons, which depends upon the number of well, the molecular weight of the substance. This picture shows a Galena pyrite and sphalerite ore sample under BSE imaging. And you can see that the pyrite is some dark gray. The Galena is very light gray and the sphalerite is hard to detect because it's it's fairly close to the pyrite. But these um, these different colors in the background are shades of gray in the background are dependent upon the the specific gravity or the density elect um, um, And get some water on the molecular weight of the of the substance. Galena, in this case, being the de the highest molecular weight, is the lightest, and pyrite, being the lowest on, in this case, is the darkest. You can also do maps of, of elements. So you can see below there where the sulfur, the sulfur includes everything. The zinc only includes the sphalerite generally. The iron only includes the pyrite. And the lead shows where the glimmer is. Here's another BSE image. In this one, the pyrite is the densest because it's pyrite quartz and organic material. So just because pyrite's white in one, it's not always white. It's all relative based on the density of the material or the molecular weights and number of electrons. 1932, Hugo Strunz developed his thesis on silicates and phosphates. And published mineralogical tables in 1941. These were then, um, his co he got a co-author after, after a while with uh, Ernie Nickel. And um, these are the Strunz classifications that are in use today. So now we've got two classifications that are main. We've got the Dana classification and the Strunz classification. Goldschmidt in 1937, who, since he was a geochemist, he um, divided, sub classified rocks as to lithophile, siderophile, calcophile, and amnophile. 
depending on whether the lithophile elements belong to those that are rock level. Siderophile associate with iron. Calcophile associate with sulfur. And atomophile uh, associate with air. The gases like um, fluorine, chlorine, they're atomophile. 1950, we have a new classification on the on the border, and it came in, it came from Britain, from Max Hay, and it is the third most commonly used classification still. 1956, the electron microprobe came on the existing casting, built the first one. And the picture of it is the upper right. Kamiko commercialized it as the MS-85 in 1956. It's capable of quantified analysis down to one to two micron areas. The next was Rahman. He actually won his Nobel Prize for, for a physics in 1930 and began studying the behavior of infinite, of light with on in iridescent surfaces, labradorite agates, opals, pearls. He finally figured out the Raman effect, which is the light transfer of material it is deflected against the cleavage, changes against the changes in light, changes freak, wavelength and frequency as it returns from the, these iridescent um, materials. But whatever really comes down to is it works for all kinds of materials, not just iridescent ones. Now by the 80s, the use of a laser source provided better use. And by the 90s, the development of the CCD, the charge couple device as a, as a uh, sensor actually improved the accuracy very higher. This is what a Raman uh, spectrum looks like. And you can see the, okay, this, this, this is the shift off of a, a Rayleigh peak, a, a spectrum peak. Um, the, it, everything drops off uh, due to the edge of the filters that are used. But um, the, the intensity, the height of the peak is correlatable with the laser power and the crystalline orientation. Uh, if you have, the peak will be there even if it's, a, if it's not oriented correctly because these lasers are are polarized so that you, as the things vib as the light of the laser vibrates in one direction, you pick up because of the electromagnetic field effect. You pick up the um, vibration amplitudes and, and harmonics in the opposite in the in the perpendicular direction. So the way the crystal is oriented makes a difference in the intensity of these. Uh, the background is fluorescence temperature and roughness surface. If you have really fine grain crystals, this background will come way up and then over like this, and you'll get very almost no amplitude on the on the signal. So it doesn't work well on that. Our machine doesn't work. A U of A machine doesn't work on uh, sulfides well because they don't have very much of a vibration. And so their frequencies are way down here below what we can detect in this, with this unit. In 1998, Bob Downs and Aaron Celestian uh, started a database for minerals. Before this, Iran was used mostly in biochemicals. Minerals were supposedly not to be could not be analyzed with Raman spectroscopy. So Celestian and 
was working on a project and he decided to try it. And they got a spectrum out of the first thing. Or maybe it was Wolfenite because it was here at Arizona. Anyway, Bomb Dowds got in on the thing and, and they started compiling data on mineral species. And then they got funding to do the rough database, which is a free public database of Ramon spectra. And the reason you need this is that there is no, there's no way to calculate a Ramon spectra. They are you need a comparative database. And so um, you, if you have a Ramon machine and no database, you don't have anything as far as trying to get mineral DNA. But with this, with the, we have over 9,000 spe species or specimens, spectra in the database right now. So after all of that, we've got the, we've got the toolbox. This is what I just call the toolbox. Um, inexpensive things, the hand lens, the hardness set, streak to contact going on or blow pipe. If anybody still wants to learn to use it, it's still, still a great tool. Uh, specific chemical tests. There's a book called Spot Test by Fiegel that describes how to determine if certain elements are in a substance. Uh, associated minerals, radio, uh, fluorescence, and experience. That's a big issue. Experience in the field is what you really need to have. Moderately costs are binocular and petrographic microscope and a photo and a camera to do photo stacking. You can see a whole lot more about crystals now that we can photograph things down to a, a millimeter or so, and with an SEM down to a few microns. Then you come to the, to the lab equipment, emission spectrometer. Ramon, infrared, which is like a Ramon, X-ray spectroscopy. Oh, infrared, the IR is spectroscopy. X-ray diffractometer, both powder and single crystal. The Canning electron microscope, or SEM, and the mic. Finally, the microprobe. So, naming a new mineral species is a four-step process. Number one is determining if it is a new species, finding the sample and comparing the characteristics against existing species. Once you've done that and decided it doesn't match all of the existing characteristics or anything, then you have to, you have to characterize its micro, micro, macroscopic properties, crystallographic properties, physical properties, optical properties, chemical properties. Description of the occurrence. Classification and the location where the specimen is going to be, the, the, the test specimen is going to be kept, as well as references. Then you get to name this, the name, the name you get, it kind of comes naming the species. And the discoverer has choice over the name that are submitted to the IMA. Finally, it's submitted submission to the Commission on New Minerals. And they decide whether they will, they will go over all of this data and decide whether it's acceptable or unacceptable. So what are minerals named for? Historically, persons, places, Impersonal names. We'll get to all of them. We'll go through each one of these. So we'll just go ahead and go through. Historical names for persons. Warner was the first, as I said earlier, Warner was the first to introduce personal names to minerals. He's Prenite for Colonel Hendrick Pren, South Africa. Torbernite for Torben O'Burden. Witherite for William Wither. Not, it was not well accepted for the mineral community. The major complaint was that the names had no 
relationship to the physical and chemical properties of the mineral. mineral many mineral names have become obsolete due to advances in analytical techniques and discredited as mineral species. These names in general cannot ever be used again. Now, I don't like the word discredited here because what you're doing is using different tools. You develop better tools than the guy that had described it. So why are you discrediting? His work is still probably partially valid. And he just didn't have all of the tools to do that, to, you know, that are available today. You know, in the 1700s, they couldn't, they couldn't see a two micron spot, spot first less be able to just get a chemical analysis. And agricolite, which is originally, is now eudiolite, eulotite. And wernerite is a synonym for scapolites. Names for places are very simple. It's, it's the Vesuvius, Mount Vesuvius for Vesuvianite, Cornwall County, England for Cornwallite, Grand Reefite for the Grand Reef Mine in Arizona. And there's lots of others. Now we'll start talking about the impersonal names. The suffix oid, which means light, is like chloritoid is a light chloride. Jadeite is like jade. Combinations of mineral names, maghemite is magnetite plus hematite. Companies, Santa Feite is the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad, which brought ore to and from the, the uh, Colorado Plateau. Mythological characters like Agerine for Agar, Scandinavian god of the sea, and for native peoples, Incaite for the Incas in Peru and Bolivia. And lastly, for project or database. Roughite for the rough project. Sorry about that. Then we have names for chemical composition. We have Samarskite for Samarian. We have solvonite, which is solvonite, which is sulfur and vanadium. It occurs in a little one, one locality, a little prospect in Utah. And eumahoite for uranium, moly, oxygen, hydrogen, and oxygen. Then we have Greek names, crystallographic things from tetrahedrite for the tetrahedron, uh, cylindrite for the round columns and the mineral, tetradamite for the, for the fourfold twin, clinoclase means inclined fracture, uh, crocoite came from saffron orange in some language. Cryolite because it looks like like ice. Barite from heavy. Anhydrite from without water. And hematite from hematesis, which is blood red. Those are all Greek. Latin. Physical by aquamarine is from the sea green color. Stanite for tin. Other old English spar was used for calcite was calspar, fluorite was fluorspar, and pearl spar was dolomite. Uh, Russian Mus muscova or muscova glass goes to muscovite, and the Spanish for platinum for plata, which is for silver. Interesting. Interesting aside there, I did some work in Colombia for plat on platinum. And the old time, the, um, the Spanish threw the platinum back in the river for it to age because they thought if it aged long enough, it would become gold. Just an aside. Then we have all the prefixes. 
plural for green. I'm not going to go through each one of these. I'm going to let you guys just look at it. You, I'm going to make this available to anybody that wants a copy. Either probably in a PDF form. Or I, Steve could publish it in the Chronicles if he wants. Then we have suffixes. Ait, which is the most common suffix, means of nature from the Greek. Lithos, light. Right, cryo light, like ice. Uh, uh, INE, tourmaline, is pertaining to. Um, oid, we just went over. Vivinulin belongs to. L uses la, the, U, the UM, electrum, argentum, those are used for elements and alloys. They're Latin. Uh, clays means fracture or break, like rhomboclays, clays, which we talked about earlier. Craze means a mixture, like polycraze. Fine. Means black, like cryptomaline. That's what should be the L I N E H N B. See, great fame in Greek means to appear, like Uranus fame. Uh, then there's Gen and I. So you have to locate them. Having the two, so Ari Cooperite has the has the quality of both. Uh, there are some that have no traceable meaning uh, origin, like Old Anglo-Saxon for gold, ice, lead, iron. Then we have polymorphism, which is the same com composition with different in a different crystal system. And in one phrase you use different names like grant, diamond, graphite, longstilite, and chalolite are all carbon compounds. You can use then the other for others you use the Greek prefixes, alpha sulfur and beta sulfur, one's monoclinic, one's I think orthorhombic. Or and now since people don't seem to know how to write Greek letters, they just it's been adding the prefix alpha and beta instead of the Greek letter. Polymorph polytypism is when you have the same composition but different structure of forms. Which you've seen things like molybdenum 2R. And this has to do with the symmetry of the stacking of the layers. Well, no, it's 2H and 3R. There we go. They're hexagonal. The, the, they have different, the same composition, but different structures. So 2H is hexagonal. And 3R is rhombohedral. Well, the unit cells have the same A dimension, but the C dimension is six point something for the unit cell. And so I mean, the C dimension of this layer is six. So two layers, H2, hexagonal two layers, gives you the 12 angstrom a unit cell for, for uh, 2H, and the 3R has three, six, so somewhere around six angstrom layers. Shown in, then they're trying to make you do more symmetry and make this more exact. Instead of just saying that it's 2H, it's, it's H hexagonal, A equals A and C equals two. So this is a nomenclature for dividing up 
or specifying more accurately the 2H designation. And you can see for the little model in the lower left-hand corner that you can see there's two stacked layers. And in the model on the right, there's three stacked layers. The top and bottom together make a layer. So the IMA was created in 1957, and it's not made up of people. The members of the International Mineralogical Association are societies, like the IMA as the American Mineralogical Society is a member. The Canadian Mineralogical Society is a member. And it was created with a bunch of people that are fairly famous. Claring Wolf of his name, Yeoman, Berger. The following commissions were created. One on new species, one on pre preservation and accessibility of type materials. One on nomenclature, one on abstracts one on the continuing publication and revision of the system of mineralogy, and the third one on museum. Series, so this is where we get into some of the more interesting things. Rare earth minerals use a suffix to designate the series like alanite CE, LA, and Y, all part of the alanite series. So it's also used in uh, other things where the cations change, um, like the zeolites. Um, in isomorphous systems, series not not the not the rare earth, not containing rare earth elements, like crustate and perorgyrite. It's an atomic substitution of arsenic and ammonia. So the series is prustite perargyrite series. And if you do not know the chemistry or the ratio of the arsenic to the animal, the proper use of the, of the name is the prustite perargyrite series. Same thing comes with xanthoconite and pyrostilkine. If you don't know the ratios, you have to use the series name. Okay, then there's three, three member series, which are actually bought two together. Pyromorphite and mimetite is a series, phosphate to arsenic. And if you look at the bottom, hedophane looks like it ought to be in that same hedophane and fossil hedophane. However, they are only in the, that part of the, the arsenic phosphate portion, but this calcium substitutes for the lead, so that's a different site. So that makes it a different series. Here's an example of pyre that I created for the pyromorphite series. I had a few analyses. You can see mimetite down on the lower right, pyromorphite on the top, and vanadinite. So it's PO, it's phosphate arsenate on the right, arsenate vanadinite on the bottom, and vanadinite pyromorphite on the left. A series of analyses shows that, that there's reasonably good indication that this is probably a complete series between pyromorphite and mimetite. Same thing happens between mimetite and vanadinite probably with enlikites being in the center. Generally, this one's not. We don't know anything. We have no, so far I have found no examples of, of uh, the series pyromorphite vanadinite. But as you plot, we plot more and more of these, we'll find these, these, they cluster in here. 
And what this really tells you is that because you find a green hexagonal prism, it's not necessarily pyromorphite. There are some nice green minotites. So that doesn't work anymore. So again, if you don't know the phosphate to arsenate ratio, it's a pyromorphite mimetite series. A group, this is the most confusing and loosest. A mineral group consists of two or more minerals of the same or essentially the same structure and composed of chemically similar elements. Okay, the, so where series is based on chemistry, group is based on structure. And so the group hierarchy is classified by the principal ion, anion, or complex. Silicates are classed on their bondings of the tetrahedra and others. Then there's family groups, which are huge groups. And there are even supergroups. The apatite supergroup include, includes mimetite and a lot of other hexagonal prisms. All these things are listed in the rough IMA um, database. And what I've shown here is how you use it. If you go to rough info IMA, you get this background sheet here, which got you put in a mineral name up here and it searches and gives you all these characteristics that you can go and look at. You can also search by chemistry if you have just chemistry. You can add crystal parameters if you have crystal parameters. And then you can export. These are the export options. You can just pick mineral name, mineral name in HTML, all the number of elements, valence of the elements, structural group names, which is good to download because you can then have it as part of your list of cataloging. Uh, Flasher's group names, which are different than IMA's group names. As I said, group names are, are very loose, somewhat loose. Then the first year published, I, I use that to produce a graph we'll see in a minute. But all of these you can download as a CSV or as a table or a list. It's very helpful and very useful. This is an example of a, of a list I created very quickly and just downloaded and saved off in Excel. The, uh, as you can see, the, chemis the chemistry is what they call chemistry plane is correct for it. And in X, this is imported right into Excel. I've had trouble getting the same chemistry imported into Access. It doesn't want to recognize the superscripts and subscripts. I'm sure there's a... Okay, so here, what is this? This is the history of mineral species by year. What it is, it starts out back in 1556 in the left-hand corner when there was 37 minerals and proceeds year by year to today or to this, this year. And the graph at the bottom is the, a line connecting the top points of a, of a stacked bar graph, showing the, the single number of space species defined in a given year. And the red line is the cumulative number of species now. We're at 5,800 and something there. So why, why, did I, why was I interested in doing this? I wanted to see if the, if the tools in our toolbox made any difference in the number of, of uh, described species. Oops. So we go back here. I certainly thought that the analytical balance would make a big difference. It made no difference. 
a polarizing microscope, maybe a few, maybe one year, two years. Development of structures, the spectroscopy didn't do much. Development of X-rays and X outer diffractometers didn't do much of anything. But the microprobe was a ground probe. This was the single most important tool developed in the in the uh, mineral species nomenclature in defining new species. I think there's another point that, we're, that I'm missing on here, and that is we need to plot the number of mineralogists working in the in that field at the time. I'm I'm guessing that in the 15 uh, seven, even up to the 1700s, the number of mineralogists working on detailed new descriptions was in the order of a few handful, a few, a few, maybe a few tens, probably less than ten. But by the time you get to the 1950s, you've got all kinds of people working on things. So there's more stuff being looked at. There's more. That people don't recognize, and so it's a it's a number of species, number of unknowns available, is, is another way of putting. I think it's very interesting. I thought these other things were going to make a difference, but then it took a, when it didn't, I had to rethink why. Okay, so we have these analytical methods. What are they good for? XRD powder is good for structure, but it has a limitation on preferred orientation of layered species like micas and clays, because you powder the material and you pack it into a small little um, container that is flat on top. So the uh, beam impinges on the, uh, the flat oriented, flat surface. And that tends to give you preferred orientations to the planes parallel to the cleavages. XRD single crystal you need a, is ideal for structure. You can get you can if if you're trying to get the structure you want untwinned crystals you need good quality, larger tough to mount in the goniometer. Well, that with Dr. Young that's somewhere around. 10 microns. With me, it's probably in half an inch. Um, it also is good for studying twinning, but it, that it's studying the twin laws is different than trying to get the structure. If you're trying to solve the structure, the twinning makes it much more difficult. Emission spec is something that has been around for a whole long time. It's qualitative at best. You get lots of elemental data. You get data for rare earth elements and such that are locked in the feldspars and the and the uh, host rocks itself. I've had prospectors come in with an e-spec and say, "I've got this stuff that has all this yttrium and whatever and whatever," and you tell them it's not extractable, and they won't understand. They think you're lying to them. So it, that's a bit of a. And the Raman structures for transparent mineral crystals, generally sulfides don't work, especially on the machine we have here, which is 15 years old. Down, Bob Downs told me that there are newer machines that you can, that don't have that limitation. SEM EDS is qualitative. It gives you the ratio, a good ratio of minerals with problems with overlap and interference. I had a pyromorphite mimetite that I took down to the, I sent down with Young to the uh, SEM lab. And they came back with a big speak spot of platinum, which we know is not right. So, because that can't afford, it's just not going to occur in that, in that chemical environment. So you need to be there to tell them, no, that's something else. Find out what that is. And usually it's a very good answer. It's a 
another iron peak or another phosphate peak or another something like that. Backscatter images are great for understanding zoning in crystals. But again, the, the analyses are quality. And to get to the final, the microprobe, which is quite expensive, has quantitative, good quantitative results. So now back to our original question. What's the answer? The correct answer is none of the above. The correct answer is feldspar group, because it includes not only the the uh, alkali feldspars, the the uh, microclines, the orthoclase, but also the pyrex, the the um, uh, plagioclase groups. And it's found feldspar is abundant in both oceanic and continental crust. And this is a this is the best sunset picture we can come up with for mineral names. This is a uh, pattern off the X-ray single crystal X-ray diffractometer, where the spots represent sites in this in the lattice. Thanks. Uh, excellent, Jim. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, very good. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Jim. That was very good, very a whole good. lot of a whole lot of information. <laughs> well, I just thought I just thought that I needed to go back to start with and build the build the build it up instead of just saying, "Well, we've got these electronic instruments. What do they do?" Totally brilliant. Yeah. 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 I love it. An enormous amount of work. Yeah. A lot yeah. of work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was probably. Yeah. A week and a half full time. Yeah, it's very, wow. much, very much appreciated, too. Yeah, super. <clears throat> it was fantastic. And it like I said, I can, either print this, I can either print this out as a PDF. That would be great, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Be yeah. As a distributor. Or he could, he can put, we can add the, I'll, I've got a, another page of um, references. Especially how to decode those old, old names. Yep. There are three or four books that are very good at that. That's marvelous. And uh, yeah, if Steve, you, would you, well, you, we can talk later, Steve, about what, how to distribute this, whether you want to put it in the Chronicles or whether you want yep. to have it as a separate item. I don't care. Yep. Cool. We'll, we'll work that Thank out. You. Very right. good. Any questions, of Jim? Everybody's stunned. He's covered the hole. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. 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 Whole new meaning. Well, it just gives you a background as to, and that's why my first slide said accuracy, not complexity. Yeah. Because yeah. everybody thinks this is more complex, the, the, the subdivision of the garnets and the pyroxenes and these things. But in reality, it's not complexity, it's accuracy. Because now we can see that these, a lot of these are zoned. And so what do you say? Unless you have analyses of each and every little layer of the zone, yeah. you, you don't have a true name. No. So you have to go back to the group names or the series names. Yeah. Yeah, it starts to get complex for um, ordinary collectors, definitely. <laughs> yeah, but that's what I was trying to explain why I didn't like the word complex. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, it's really, it, it appears complex, but in reality, it's accuracy. Yeah. Um, it works nicely when talking with children, too, and they're looking at something that someone tells them is diopside. But diopside can look so very different in terms of its color, its transparency, its, its morph outward its morphology. And then they look at something else and someone tells them, oh, that's henbergite. And <laughs> it's really, it really helps to be able to explain to them that minerals, even 
the name doesn't mean that this diopside is exactly the same as this diopside. It's part of a series that is based on chemistry. And then they start looking at minerals quite differently. Uh, uh, once I've been able to get this idea through, and they're more fascinated, generally speaking. So children appreciate that kind of, uh, the more precise, and I'm using your word, uh, idea that is in, encapsulated in things like a series, for example. So anyways, I'm just yeah. throwing that out. <laughs> I also like to use the classic birthstones as an example of varieties versus species. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because yes. you, you have, there's, there's not very many species represented in the yeah. historic birthstones. Because hmm. you've got barrels, so you've got aquamarine, you've got morganite, yeah. which are all barrels. You've got citrine, you've got uh, opal, which are all silica, so quartz is of some sort or another. Or you go to some of the older ones, and basically there are many, many different kinds of chalcedony <laughs> that are that are used for. Uh, well, stones distinctive by month or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like eyebrows. <laughs> I was just thinking, away. <laughs> yeah. you've got your whole class, they've all got eyebrows, hopefully, and then you compare them, there's going to be so many different angles, colours, shapes. Yeah, I'd try eyebrows. <laughs> That's I'm a good one. I like that. <laughs> is, is, only yeah. only oh, you, I'm Sheila. Happy. Only you. Only, only you to do that, <laughs> Sheila. <laughs> Yeah. So <clears throat> and then we start with Belson's eyebrows. <laughs> I haven't done any. Furry capillaries. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah then you have eyebrows. The same as my head, not existing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, any other non eyebrow or hair related questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jim, I really appreciated your talk and you spoke nice and slowly. Um, okay. Steve, I'm glad you re recorded this because I'd like to bring it for a club program this fall, yep. you know, the recording. Yep. Um, I do have a question. I, I really appreciated your slide on the new mineral species by year. And I noticed that you concluded with 2000 at 2014. Um, That's naming just on the That's naming just the last number on the chart. Sure. So it was uh, in 2014, 140 uh, number of species. So how many do you think, how many species do you think are at present? There's 5,860 some odd. Mm -hmm. Just a few. 5,829. Just a few. <laughs> I've got to wait to go yet then. <laughs> yeah, just a few. <laughs> Well, we've, so we've how, like in the lab here at the U of A, we've got six sitting here ready for submittal. Wow. It's it seems like, like every done. two years it, it goes up by almost a thousand recently. Yeah. But, <laughs> but how many have we got sitting on specimens? We never never got to be known what it is because we can't get it tested. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. the whole yeah. point. Yeah. 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 So this going through my as a volunteer with Dr. Young. I'm going through my collection and looking at things that I've set aside that were look different. Yeah. And we're, there's four of us that are volunteers with Dr. Young. And uh, that's why that's one of the reasons why he's had such success in describing new minerals. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> But the, the better the techniques uh, are, uh, are being, uh, the, the, the more and more difficult yeah. it's, uh, it is to make yeah. distinctions. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. if you, you take the, 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 the example, the agadites, agadites are, are, are EE minerals. There's no such thing as one of those. You always mix, uh, mix, right. mix, mix, mix the minerals because the technique gets better. So you can uh, yeah, 
can 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 measure on a much more detailed level. Yeah. <laughs> so that that for, for for amateurs, that for hobbyists like us, that makes it. Uh, no, oh, well, not easy. To say the least. Well, it's not e it's not easy, and, it, and it's expensive. If you oh, want to, we want to get an exact okay. an exact name for everything. Yeah, it's almost impossible. Well, if you had a Roman, I just, you I just stick the letter U in front of my, on my catalog for unknown and leave it at that for the time being. <laughs> <laughs> leave it a number and stick a U in front after after the number. That's the best <laughs> way. So somebody in the future will sort that little lot out. I'll be dead and gone by then and won't know about it, but. <laughs> now, I would ask if it makes still sense uh, to uh, have a systematic collection, because if you go this yeah. far in uh, splitting up different kinds, it, it's, well, it's not very nice anymore. If you have Saturate and, uh, well, what's it? Uh, uh, Hank uh, with the agadite, it, it's, it becomes very difficult to collect them all. Yeah. Yeah. It's also increasingly difficult to give give them just a name because there are all these things are mixed. Uh, there's, there's no such thing as agadite CE or agadite uh, itrim or whatever. Yeah. All these things have, have uh, different REs in, in, the, in their grid. Yeah. And Hank, they it's may all, be zoned uh, down the crystal. Sorry? Yeah. They may be zoned down the crystal. <laughs> and the, the crystal grew. Yeah. 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 So yeah. The rare earth time ratios change. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Kathy, again, back to your question about the number. Uh, that graph does include everything that was approved by the IMA through uh, June. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have yeah. to wait till when you can get a mobile phone that you just aim at your rock. Uh, <laughs> I think that. It's going. We're dreaming of Star Trek. Plan, plan, plan snap. Why not? Yeah, you've got to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. mineral snap. Mineral snap. Yeah. Yeah. Mineral snap. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> The, the, really important, yeah, the really important thing is to curate what you've got prop as best as you can, because yeah, maybe someone in the future, yeah. you know, will be able that's, to. That's or my theory. Information in the yeah. future, yeah, yeah, that's our, our job, isn't it? Really, to curate yeah. what we've got. Well, curate what right. you've got, and make sure that it, yeah. it goes somewhere after you've gone, and make so yeah. somebody else can look after it properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it, and labelled with a. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. To all those comments, I asked Bob Downs to review this thing yesterday, and he was very helpful. And he said that, he, that on the block somewhere in the research is a handheld or desktop Ramon. Yeah. Which there's a Chinese firm who sell these things. Yeah. Uh, they, they cost about 16,000 to handheld uh, Raman, but uh, yeah. as far as I understand, the, 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 the range of these things is too limited. Well, yeah. part of the problem, too, is our minimum magnification on the Raman here in Arizona is 100x. So oh. you have to have a stable platform in order to have this that kind of magnification. Yeah. It's 100, 500. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we pick a crystal off, then we can do it by itself at 500 x. Great. But the nice yeah. thing about the Ramon is generally I do it on my specimens, and it's non-destructive unless you burn a hole. In it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes so, some things don't react well to the laser, yeah. and they burn them up. So that's a characteristic, isn't it? It's gone up in smoke. Yeah. So yeah. I've, oh. I've done that. You, I've you, done always, that. you always burn a hole in it. It's just that it's very small and generally and you don't see it. No, 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 not necessarily. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if it, it, the light goes, the laser goes in and reflects off of the internal structure and then is returned. If the if you there is no hole, there's no damage at all. If the no. if the laser if the material is not susceptible to things with a lot of water in them are, oh, are yeah, okay. things with mercury, uh, 
some are crocoid is one that doesn't do well. It tends to have holes and stuff like that or, or not for some odd reason. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Thank right. you again, well, Jim. That was great. It, it yeah. was. Uh, any more Thanks. questions? Yeah. Thanks, everybody, yeah. for listening. Oh, that was brilliant. Uh, that was brilliant. Uh, yeah. Good. Uh, yeah, it's a super piece of work. Yeah. Really yeah. super. Well, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it'll, it will be available to anybody. Yeah, we'll, we'll work on Many thanks. Yeah, thank, yeah. You. thank you. Thank you. PDF, PDF will be great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very good. All right. Okay. Um, see you all again in two weeks' time. A couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, Good okay. right. yeah. yeah. morning. Bye. 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 Yeah, right. Bye. -bye.